Welcome to the 48th episode of Retuning Your Firm. Uh, this is Richard Chaplin, CEO of the Managing Partners Forum. Delighted to be your host for today. Um, what we're doing today is to basically bring together some really interesting people. First of all, I'd like to introduce you to Julian Birkinshaw, who's the Professor of Strategy and Entrepreneurship at the London Business School. Um, uh, if you haven't read any of Julian's books, they're always really interesting, um, his papers and everything. And he's, I'll always go to him for new ideas. He, he's an amazing guy. So thank you for joining us today, Julian. Um, <clears throat> next, we have Alastair Macapra, who's Chief Executive of the Chartered Institute of Public Relations. And some of you may be aware there's a little bit of a lobbying problem going on at the moment in this country. So um, it'll be really interesting to hear from the professional body for lobbyists and exactly where do they think we're at. Um, Jeremy Beard, Managing Partner of Hayes McIntyre. Um, Jeremy's firm, as you may be aware, is also very strong in the professional body space, and he himself is in that group, so when his <clears throat> management time allows. So again, it'll be really interesting to hear how that plays, and Julian will be giving some tips. So hopefully Jeremy will be very much in his element today. And welcome back also, of course, Francesca, who is, <clears throat> like me, in the 40s in terms of the appearances on the show. I'm a little bit older than that, I'm afraid, but onwards and upwards. And as I said, yours truly. So, so what are we going to do today? Well, I kind of wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, management and how people are managing in the, is it the hybrid world? Is it the dynamic world? There's various terms that are floating around, but how are people going to be managing in that dynamic world? And there's a, um, we'll be doing a poll on it. And then Julian's been getting us some really interesting insights based on a much more rigorous survey that he and others did with interviews and all sorts of things. And, um, and secondly, we're just, Alistair's going to be looking a little bit about the whole issue of how does a professional body really um, manage itself when the expectations of that body are maybe out of sync with it, the reality of its powers to uh, encourage particular types of behaviour. So hopefully we've got a really interesting uh, set lined up today. Um, just to remind you that um, if you've missed last week, we had... Um, uh, Dominic Holder, who's obviously Julian's colleague, uh, who talked a bit about business strategies. Uh, today we're talking more about managing, if you appreciate. We talked about shared ownership uh, and how that improves productivity. And we looked with the Centre for Cities on the likely impact of home working on UK cities. So if you haven't watched those slots, do go and watch them. They're free. And we're getting four or five hundred people every month watching one or more of those slots, which is really great. So that's good. Um, the second thing that we wanted to do was to sort of... Um, say that uh, coming up very soon we have, and you probably got it already, a Retuning Your Firm Summit. That's coming up in 22nd of June. And uh, what I've done is I've invited 25 of the people whose slots uh, were, if you like, the most popular on YouTube to come back and to talk a bit about a, a particular area of expertise, whether it's around um, the technology, the finance, the operations, or, or indeed the firm. So that's really exciting, We've got 25, 26, I think, people who are going to be coming back, all of whom you will have seen during the months on this show, which is really exciting. Um, what else have we got coming up? Well, you may have seen that um, we've been up talking a little bit about the Intra Lounge over the last few weeks. It's very much now and live. I was doing some demos to a big uh, New York uh, law firm about it the other day. And there's a lovely video we've just put together, which um, I would absolutely encourage you to watch. Um, also, I wanted to show you the latest floor plan. This one's really fun. Um, this is a very sort of um, the blue room, we're going to call it the blue hall. But um, but the one that's really capturing everyone's attention is the uh, the garden. And I was talking to a, um, a lovely lady in Portugal, actually, the other day. And she kind of said to me in the middle of the conversation, she said, Rich, you know, it's my birthday today. And you've just made my day because talking to you in this garden just took me all away from everything else I'm doing. So I thought, how wonderful is that? So true story a few days ago. So, so what does that take us? Well, as you know, we um, obviously are looking to um, actually help you as an organization, but more so you as individuals. And one of the things that we've been working on is how can we foster interactivity amongst this group? I mean, you, you, most of you come on every week and you listen and hopefully you go with some great ideas, but you're not really interacting as a group. So what we thought we'd do is we will take the intra lounge and we will make it available to you as a group. And not just that, but we'll give you a place where you can have a discussion forum. And we'll also give you the chance to uh, watch some of the videos that obviously we're recording as the show continues. So I'll be in touch with you over the next week, probably around that. But hopefully that's going to be something that will sort of add 
can some spice to the, the the group of people who've come together over the last year. And I really do think of you as an amazing community. So so thank you for that. Um, we now move on to the next phase of the uh, session, if you like. And we're looking at polls and our polls are very popular. There's a lovely quote from government, which you may have seen already. Your poll results are incredibly valuable in our analysis during these dynamic times. I didn't ask for that feedback. It was it just came to me. And, uh, you know, that that to me was, was really quite amazing. So um, thank you very much to government for for listening. Now, whether they're going to do anything about it, who knows? That's another story. But at least if you're not passing what this group feel are important to government, we're not doing our job. So thank you for that. So what are we going to be doing this week? Well, first of all, I'm going to take you through what we did last week. And hopefully that will be of interest. So the first thing we asked was, um, which of these various um, expressions, phrases describes the current situation? And the one I really wanted you to focus on is the one to the right. And the, tr the words may be a little bit, it's called on track for post COVID success. And what it's saying is that the blue is the professional firms, the people on this call, you, you guys, many of you from last week, and the red is your most important clients. The mismatch is really quite extreme. Um, so your clients, a lot of them are gonna be in no dominant situation, which is over to the left, but for the people who are really recovering. So it's all very well, you're feeling positive, but if your clients aren't there for you, where's the money uh, is rather, rather crude way of putting it. So productivity, we talked a bit about that, obviously. Um, I think most people, saying that productivity has increased, that's the over to the right, and there's far less uh, over to the left, apart from far left, which is the people who are not too sure. So productivity has seemed to increase. The idea that everyone was going to sit at home, watch Netflix, well, that might have been five minutes, but actually they then go on with work, quite frankly. Um, the general mood towards people returning to the office, and it's quite interesting here, because um, if we go back to September, which is when we last ran that particular question, um, we had a about a 60% gap between the people who were apprehensive, which was the red ones, and the people who were relaxed, which was the blue ones. And that gap is very much narrowed. It's still there, but it's more like 15% now rather than 60. So that should make life easier if you are and when you are asking people to return to the office. Um, what's happening in terms of firms opening their offices? 26% uh, have already done so. 11% within the next month, big chunk, 37 within three months, 11 uh, more than three months, but 16% still haven't decided last week. Um, better get your skates out is all I say, because your people will be definitely wanting to know what's going on. Um, and when things do go back to offices being reopened, what are you actually gonna be doing that's different? Well, flexibility for people to continue working from home within clear guidelines, 65% and undecided 30%. Um, well, that to me means pretty much everybody is going to be allowing their people to work from home because 65% of 70 is about 95% if you can do the math, massive percentages. People working on a given day, some people we know are making Friday off, taking Friday afternoon off. Others, it's the other way around. People want to come into the office precisely because it's Friday and it's a great start to the weekend for because the office is now a social place and we'll talk a lot more about that today. So, again, I think there's still some undecideds there. 30 percent still haven't quite decided on changes to working practices. Again, get your skates out. Um, how long will you be expecting people to be in the office? 42 percent undecided, 37 percent saying around half of the time, over 90 percent zero. So it's pretty clear that there's nobody full time isn't going to happen back in the office. But with 42 percent undecided, it's quite hard to say that people we really quite know. And then when it comes to what are you going to be using the offices for clients, will you allow people in? And we had a biometric uh, conversation the other week. You know, are you allowing clients in? Yes, you are fairly quickly. Um, certainly 58 percent once the office is open, only 11 percent undecided. But what are other people um, events, for example? 53% undecided. So what you've got is a kind of an interesting situation. So we thought, well, okay, we've got, we've looked at some of the strategy. We've looked at some of the, uh, the, the, if you like, the decisions that management is now having to take, but what's happening in the management space? So what we're doing today is we're going to run a poll and, and what this poll is, is doing is looking at management. Like how can we manage in a hybrid world? And, and, and the issues we're looking at here, and, and you can see it on the slide, the dominant leadership style, pre, during and post COVID. 
how you're spending your time pre and during COVID, what management activities are contributing to helping your firm achieve its objectives pre, during, and hopefully and post COVID, and, uh, and, your, and yourself as a manager, how effective is you? And I'd like to really thank Julian Birkinshaw for inspiring the questions in that poll. So what's this telling us? Well, the inspire and enable is slightly more popular than challenge and support pre-COVID. Um, there weren't too many command and control and very few people of anyone was doing contract and review. So that's kind of pre-COVID. Um, if we move to what's been happening over the past year, again, Inspire and Label remains, has sort of crept up from 45 to 59. Um, Challenge and support remains strong uh, and not too many people have descended into command and control or contract and review. So that's quite encouraging. And moving then into the, the hybrid world, the dynamic world, question three, what's going to be the optimal management style? Very much uh, a flavour of the way that you've been managing through the past year. So that's, that's interesting in itself. In terms of which areas have they been spending more time? Uh, the one that comes through highest is managing down. Um, that's 55% and then managing across 52 um, externally facing work is much lower. So again, I think that's a bit different from some of Julian's uh, surveys. That's quite interesting whether this sector is a bit different, who knows. Um, in terms of where less time has been spent, it's external. So the focus for the management team has been very internal. That's the message I'm taking away from that. Um, which are the activities that contribute most to helping your firm achieves objectives, uh, getting the best from your team, 69%. That comes through very strongly. Communicating effectively, 59 And those are the big two, I think, looking quickly down that list. And during the lockdown, communicating effectively, that's, that's 86%. I mean, that has been, that's really been something that people have really focused on. And remember, I'm only asking you for the top three here. Uh, I can't do anything more sophisticated in Zoom, but it's actually quite interesting. So I was thinking like the three things that matter most are probably the ones that you're most likely to do. So 86% massively communicating effectively has come through really, really strongly there. And all the others are sort of 30, understanding and motivating others, 45. So I'm just reading this as we go along, if you appreciate. Um, in a hybrid world, which three activities will contribute most to helping your firm. Again, communication comes through very strongly, getting the best from your team, understanding and motivating others. So those are the three areas that people are really focusing on. And then in terms of personal, uh, what have you been actually found yourself working more effectively at, at communication, uh, at getting the best from your team and understanding motivating others and very similar. But if we actually look into the areas that they've been less effective, and this is quite interesting. What's coming through quite strongly here is creativity. Uh, the area that people, managers have found difficult and have been less effective at is fostering creativity, uh, personal time management, possibly. And those are the two big ones with and also making change happen. So, again, I'm not going to say any more than that. I'm not. I, hopefully that will at least give us some thoughts. I will now, if I may, turn over to Julian and welcome, sir, and your Tell us a little bit more about managing through a, in, yeah. well, managing through the pandemic and beyond, maybe is the best way to describe it. Over <clears throat> to you, sir. Thank you, Richard. Um, so fascinating stuff, actually. Um, I've, um, I've been researching changes in leadership and management styles for years. And during the, um, the first wave of the pandemic in June or so, I realized that I had done a number of surveys in the previous, previous two years, which I could then do again during the pandemic uh, and then compare the results. And, and that is, if you're a, a sort of a social scientist and academic, that is vital because one of the problems with the survey we've just done is of course, we are retrospectively making sense of what we used to be like, and that's incredibly difficult to do. So, so my results, the, I'm gonna share a couple of the highlights uh, my results are not going to be completely consistent with what you just said, uh, but I actually believe my results, you know, in the main are, 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 are valid because the previous, the pre-COVID data was literally measured before anybody knew that COVID was a thing. And when you ask exactly the same questions during COVID with roughly the same samples of people, you can draw some useful insights. So I'm gonna share a couple of the highlights from the research and I'll try to pick up on how those results are different to what you just said. 
just by way of clarity, uh, I'm not interested in this research in sort of what you and I are doing as individuals. I'm particularly interested in how our managerial or leadership style has changed through the pandemic. And essentially what I did was I, I measured a bunch of the stuff that Richard has actually shared with you. And, and I bucketed the activities of the manager leader into three categories. I took sort of cognitive reflective work, essentially, you know, sitting you know, in front of your computer, thinking about problems, resolving you know, issues in your mind, making sure that you understood issues properly. Sort of, you know, one of the parts of any manager's job is, is, is cognitive and reflective. The second was making things happen. In other words, actually getting to decisions, bringing the right people around the table, making sure that everybody knows what they're doing and, and, and executing uh, sort of the action part of, of your job. And then the third is, is what we can call the behavioral or the social parts of your job, which is getting things done through others. In other words, making sure that the people who report to us and the people in our wider team feel energized, motivated, safe, secure, all of the things that we as leaders or managers feel is a big part of our job. And essentially, if you take those three categories of activities and you say, using you know, exact same questions pre-COVID and during COVID, where do we see differences in how effective people have been? The answers from my data were, when it comes to cognitive and reflective work, people actually reckon they are being more effective during lockdown. And that is, for me, completely understandable because we've got, uh, we've got fewer disturbances. We are not being inter inter interrupted every few minutes by, by people around us. We can actually focus on the task in hand and get to the bottom of it. When it comes to being effective at making decisions and solving problems and getting the right people on the job, uh, it turns out that on average, people are, are seeing themselves as being marginally more effective during lockdown than they were before. Uh, and that for me is because you know, we've got a good sense of who our teams are. People are quite task focused. People are quite good at saying, this is a crisis. I need to make sure that, that I deliver as, as required. Um, and it turns out that basic coordination over Zoom, when it's people you know, works pretty well. The big surprise, and this is, uh, is going to be very different to what the results of the survey that you just did say, is that when it came to the, the people side of your jobs, and this is getting the best out of your team, motivating others, having difficult conversations, uh, the, the creative stuff, uh, which is a separate category in some ways, all those people aspects are significantly, in academic terms, there's a particular meaning to significantly, but, but you'll have to trust me on this, significantly lower rated during lockdown than before. So even though our intentions during lockdown for communicating effectively and managing and getting the best out of our team and trying to energize people, even though our intentions have been good through that whole period, the evidence says that actually, in terms of what happened before versus what happened during, uh, we are struggling a little bit. So I've, I've written an academic paper on this. I'm happy to share it with you. Um, and, and I call the book, the, the, the paper, I call it The Blinkered Boss. And why I use the word blinkered is that my evidence suggests that during a lockdown situation, when we're not quite as you know, engaged in a day-to-day -day basis with the people around us. It is easy to turn inward. It is easy to turn towards getting things done, productivity, efficiency, and task. And it's very easy actually to let some of the more social aspects of getting the best out of the people around us to slip. And as I say, no one is intentionally doing that, but it's just that much harder to spend the time doing those things. So that is the headline from the findings of my research. We're turning a little bit inward. And as a result, we have to be doubly cautious or thoughtful about making the most of our relationships with our colleagues. And of course, that's an average finding. Many of you are already doing everything I'm about to say, but it doesn't mean that it's easy and we've got to actually work harder than, than before. And a big part of that, of course, is because you know, the, the levers of influence that we have as leaders and managers of others are much more curtailed. We simply don't have the opportunities on a day-to-day -day basis 
that we had when everybody was in the office. So let me just finish with two two observations and then and then I will uh, give the floor back to Richard. Um, I did a lot of interviews around the research. And one comment uh, is worth repeating here. I'm going to try to quote it exactly. The guy said, I used to think of the office as the place to get tasks done and home as the place for the social stuff. And now it's the exact opposite. And this is a guy who's essentially now being allowed to go into the office one or two days a week. And what he's saying, of course, is that the office is, is a place where lots of things happen uh, and a lot of it's actually quite social and he's like many of us he's craving those social opportunities and strangely enough the, the place of work at home is hugely kind of um, efficient in terms of just putting your head down and working but if I want to socialize and indeed get work done socially if you see what I mean then the office is the place to do it so that's one and then the second one which is where I'll stop is professional development becoming better at doing your job that's not just about attending training courses. That is about doing challenging new work assignments. Many of you will have heard of the so-called 70-20-10 principle, which says that real learning and development happens through on-the-job experiences and challenging assignments. Well, one of the real challenges that we faced over the last 12 months is that it's so easy as a manager or a leader of others to put your A team on the difficult jobs. In other words, we've got something to be done. I know those people can do the job. So I'm gonna ask them to do it again because it's hard to get a new team together in lockdown. The trouble is that means that the B team or the people who are, shall we say apprentices and who are, would otherwise join the A team, those people are not getting the opportunities. There's a concept out there called situated learning, which is that most learning happens experientially in an apprentice-like fashion by joining a team, first of all, on the periphery before moving, if you like, into the center of it. And it feels to me like many of those learning opportunities that a lot of people in our organizations need, a lot of those learning opportunities have been put on hold. And so there's a real opportunity for all of us who lead or manage others to be much more thoughtful about giving apprentice-like opportunities, internships, you know, opportunities to do things which otherwise we wouldn't actually have the skills for, even in a lockdown situation. So Richard, I'm gonna stop there. There's much more I can say, but I know we've got a bit of time uh, in, the, in the second half as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Um, that's really interesting. And uh, obviously looking forward to uh, hearing next from Alistair, who's going to come and talk to us a little bit about professionalism, the role of the professional body, but his professional body is the one that lobbyists belong to. So I, I suspect we're going to be covering some topical issues as well. Over to you, sir. Uh, thanks very much, Richard. Hello. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Alistair McCapra. I'm the Chief Executive of the Chartered Institute of Public Relations. We are a voluntary regulator, which means that nobody needs to join our association. They join if they want to. Um, as a condition of joining, they sign up to a code of conduct and they submit themselves to our uh, process for handling complaints. Uh, and they, they accept the fact that if we find that they haven't lived up to the expectations set out in our code of conduct, then we will expel them. Exactly what the effect of being expelled by a voluntary regulator is, is debatable. Um, we, we don't issue and revoke licenses to practice, uh, as is the case in uh, regulated professions. So it's, it's certainly not a career ending thing. Um, and I think the issue I, I would like to touch on briefly this morning is uh, one way of thinking about it is the gap between public perception of professionalism and what can be done about professionals who aren't meeting the grade and the reality of what organizations like mine are able to do. I mean, I, I think the public um, expects quite naturally that um, if they um, want to call somebody to account, that there is an organisation that will that will do it, will act on their behalf, or or hear that matter. Um, uh, my experience of dealing with public, um, both in in my current role and in previous roles, is that overwhelmingly people find the experience of trying to bring a complaint and. Most, the most common uh, outcome, actually, of complaints is that the complainant just gives up, um, it, is that it's, it's deeply unsatisfactory. So I want to talk about why that is and what the consequences are and, and what, what we want to do about it. And this, this is, in terms of kind of fine-tuning, this is not this perhaps not so much a fine-tune, it's a fundamental, uh, going back to first principles, about what, what does it mean to be a professional 
Um, and what is, what is the social contract between the professional and society? And how effective is the professional body at um, mediating between the professional and society uh, if, if, it's, if it's possible that the, that the professional is not meeting society's expectation? So if you think about trust in institutions, I mean, pretty much everything we've heard for the last 20 years is that public trust in fill in the blanks is declining. There are, there are not many things where public trust has risen um, over the last couple of decades. Um, trust, public trust in professionals isn't generally particularly high. Um, it is very high for nursing and it's almost as high for doctors, but nurses I think consistently come out at the top. Journalists, I think, come out, come out at the bottom. Most of the others, management consultants, lawyers and so forth, bump along um, somewhere in the middle. But generally, the public um, don't, when, you know, when asked, don't appear to, to, to have a great deal of, of trust in them. Now, what we say to the public is, look, we have a code of conduct. Um, we make sure that our members, you know, have proper qualifications when they join. Um, and we've got this complaints process. So if you feel that uh, one of our members has done the wrong thing, you can bring it to us and we'll hear that. But the question is, is, is that whole mechanism really fit for purpose? So um, I imagine many people who are listening this morning will have bought or sold a house. Um, in my entire life, I don't believe I've ever met anybody who found the experience of dealing with lawyers for conveyancing a pleasant one. Um, mostly, I think people have been open mouthed at, at the delay, uh, the, the sort of omissions, you know, the, the, the sheer frustration of um, trying to do what, you know, what must be a kind of fairly, fairly commonplace, fairly straightforward transaction. Um, I wonder how many people ha have had that experience themselves. And I wonder if anybody's actually raised a complaint about a lawyer arising from that. Um, I, I did personally, only an inter, you know, with their employer, and it was resolved satisfactorily. Um, that's, that's just one example, um, fairly low level, but widespread. Uh, an example of a much more extreme um, and thankfully unusual case um, is Grenfell Tower, where the full story has yet to emerge. But it's, it's clear that there was a whole chain of events stretching over years, which began certainly with false claims being made about um, some building products um, and just dozens and dozens of people from you know professional planners you know professional architects um, building services engineers all sorts of people who had the responsibility to protect the public you know did their little bit of the work and the, the, the sum total of their work was that materials which were not fit for purpose were put on a building and you know 70 odd people died um, and, you know, I, 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 if you listen to the testimony of the professionals who've given evidence so far, on the whole, it's not very edifying stuff. So um, the, 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 the question which I'm thinking about for the CIPR and which I'm discussing with other professional bodies is, um, is, is, is the, the social contract between the professions and society where we want it to be? Is it healthy and sound? Does it need to be revitalized? And what role do we as professional bodies play in that? And what that really focuses in on is our complaints process. Is our complaints process fit for purpose? Um, if, um, if it's going to take six months and be utterly exhausting for a complainant to bring you know, a relatively low level matter such that most people just don't even bother bringing it. And if the only outcome is that somebody is expelled from membership of a voluntary regulator and just carries on doing what they're doing anyway, um, are, we, are we really adding much value to society? So um, I don't have very positive answers to those questions at the moment. Uh, I am pleased to say that this, this sort of range of questions is something that many professional bodies are asking themselves. And I, you know, I've mentioned law here and I've mentioned some of the built environment professions. I don't mean to single them out at all. Um, that there are, there are right across the board professional bodies are asking these questions. If we've got you know, 24, 24 hour news cycle and social media exploding um, in a matter of minutes over one breaking story after another, the whole way that we go about trying to deal with uh, these sort of high, high risk, high profile issues just seems to belong in, in the Victorian age. It's, it's just not fit for purpose. So that, I don't have any answers at all. Those are the questions that I'm, I'm thinking about at the moment uh, and having some very interesting discussions with other professional bodies about these matters. 
Oh, thanks, Alistair. That's great. Um, we're going to ask Jeremy to join us now. And Jeremy, as I mentioned earlier, wears two hats here. He's uh, involved in his own firm's own very uh, well, well-known professional bodies practice, if that's the right terminology. Um, uh, but he's also the managing partner of his own firm. So he's kind of in between the uh, hopefully we'll have views on both the topics we've heard about today. So over to you, sir, for your thoughts, Jeremy. Th thank you, Richard. Um, perhaps if I perhaps if I deal with the professional body side of things first um, and, and Alistair's conversations. And again, I, I guess I uh, m my two hats come into play here because I am uh, in my management role, obviously, I deal with our own professional body uh, from time to time on various matters uh, and our regulators, um, as well as in my um, much reduced client area now, but 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 dealing with with other professional bodies. Certainly, and, and Alistair's talking about about regulation. That is that is a key aspect of of, of many professional bodies' role. Um, uh, in terms of building confidence um, in, in in their own professions, um, and indeed, you know, the audit profession is is certainly in the spotlight at the moment. And and the recent white paper, which we touched on a couple of weeks ago, around restoring trust in in audit and corporate governance is 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 very much focused on on that. But I think I, I would say, wouldn't I? That is. That it is in equal measure uh, aimed at corporate governance within entities as much as it is aimed at the audit profession. But what I would say is important is is proportionality, which is being talked about a lot in the context of regulation in, in our profession. Consideration of, uh, uh, and I guess it amounts to the same thing around proportionality, co costs and benefits. Um, consideration as to whether the regulator has a, a, a carrot or stick approach. Um, and, and certainly there's lots of conversations uh, with, with uh, the audit profession and the regulators at the moment around how much the regulator has a, 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 an education role in terms of improving standards as opposed to um, you know, just bringing out the stick every time and imposing sanctions and fines and where ultimately is that going to get us? Surely the objective is that we all get better and we all improve and that restores or builds confidence in, in society. Uh, so those those are my comments uh, on, on Alistair. Regarding um, Julian's, Julian's topics, uh, Richard, as you know, Often I say at this stage, oh, yeah, there's something for me to think about there or, or, or something that, that, that we haven't done. And, and you, you very kindly comment on my, my openness. Um, cognitive reflective work. I, I suppose I've, I've uh, for the last um, 30 years until I moved into management, um, my, my working life has largely been around um, a timesheet and, and and doing work and charging time, et cetera. And, and at the moment, I, spy, I find I spend an awful lot of time reflecting and thinking about things. And I get to the end of the day and I think, I've done nothing today. I've achieved nothing. But um, Julian's absolutely right. That, that, that time is so valuable. But, it, but, but in a management role, sometimes it, it, it can be quite you, you do re self reflect and 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 you do get concerned at the amount of time that you do spend because of course it's very difficult to measure and as i say i've been used to a timesheet and <laughs> and all the rest of it where it's been very easy to measure my productivity uh, and, and so i i do i do find that a challenge making things happen has been relatively easy i think dur during the pandemic um uh, in a sense that you've had to make decisions, you've been faced with decisions, and then you, you know you've had to do them. So, so that's fine. Um, and the behavioural piece uh, around getting things done, I think the challenge there has been, you know, the the, the workload at the moment, the stress levels, etc., of all our colleagues um, it, it has been increased, and therefore 
it, it's really been a challenge to 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 force things through when you know people are under a lot of pressure and have a lot of things to do themselves. Um, so those are those are just some of my my thoughts. Very interesting quote on on going to the office to socialise. Um, as you know, as an, a, a typical accountancy practice, we have an awful lot of um, individuals who are who are fresh out of university um, and under the age of thirty. And, and comments that come back to me now are: "We'll certainly be in the office on Friday because that's the day we go to the pub and that's the day we socialise." And and that's as far as I'm concerned, that's fantastic. You, you know, I think we all thought that Friday would be a quiet day in the office, but actually, maybe it's going to flip around and be a busy day. But look, if it, the the social aspect of work is so vital and so important, as far as I'm concerned, and and uh, if they're going in the office because it means they go to the pub in the evening, that that's fantastic. Yeah, as long as they don't stay in the pub all day, of course, that's another story. Francesca, I think those you, days are long think? gone, Richard. <laughs> yeah, amen to that. Yeah, oh, amen. I remember Francesca. those days, Jeremy. Oh, that feels like a lifetime away. Um, well, I, I just, I, I mean, a couple of things that just really stood out from, from today. I mean, going, going back to the whole professional body l- lobbying um, issue, I, there's something really fascinating about um, how professional bodies look at these issues and then how it seems to be happening within that government sphere. And I think we all find it a little bit shocking to think that people would um, not go through a bit more rigour in the way that they were lobbying and that sort of um, that sort of side door approach, which just feels very distasteful. I mean, I've been involved in many, many accounting body lobbying campaigns to try and change the law make the tax world better, make accounting better. And that feels like a legitimate response from a professional body to point out the things that aren't working, to make sensible suggestions and accept the fact. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But there's something so odd about the fact that you, you, you do that little side call and, and try and get through the back door to get to get ahead. Um, it, it, it gives a very distasteful feel. And I'd be fascinated to hear uh, when we come back uh, for, for Alistair's view on, on, on what we can learn from people who do it well, uh, as opposed to, to people who seem to be trying to circumvent it. Um, but I do, and I, I really loved all the, the, the things that Julian was saying. Um, everyone's after your paper, Julian, so I don't know if you have a link and if you can share it. People would love to get hold of it. Uh, several people have asked for that already. Um, it, it, I think this is really kind of kept for capturing the point that Jeremy was making, is that if, if you're going to have a dynamic working environment, timesheets begin to make no sense at all, do they? They just begins to become a barrier rather than a, a help. Can you manage productivity in a different way? Everyone I talk to tells me how much more productive they've been. And that's flowing through in the figures. You have to look at your your, your figures for what's coming through in terms of revenue and work wins and um, actual margins to see that people have been way more productive in the last year because you cut out commuting and you cut out all the nonsense of having to go and find somewhere to eat and you take all of that stuff out. Suddenly people are much more productive. But um, when we go back to whatever the new the, the new world will look like, uh, we'll, there's a fear that some of that pr- productivity might fall away. But actually, how how do you begin to measure real productivity? Is it in the hours you, you fit onto a timesheet or is it in what your actual output looks like? And I suspect the higher up the professional services chain you got, you got it's more about quality of output than the hours you spent doing something. So I think it is a fantastic challenge for us in professional services about how we record what we do, how we measure what we do. And true dynamic working is not about the actual physical hours. It's about the output and the way that you've done it. So I think that's going to be a fascinating topic for professional services to really wrestle with, because how do you turn it into productive productivity as opposed to just recorded time. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, Julian, just a <clears throat> quick point on the paper, because <clears throat> you obviously asked me not to share it, so I shall um, do whatever you want. Um, but um, uh, can I just explore this learning and development point a bit more? Because one of the points I found quite interesting you making was that people are uh, learning at home through going on Zoom or, or whatever, but they're not learning with their colleagues in the same way. Is, is that something you'd like to just explore? Yeah, I, let, thank you. Uh, I'd love to <laughs> expand on that. I mean, if you think about how we develop as, as professionals, um, obviously we need new knowledge, 
But we also need to find ways of exercising that knowledge. And partly that is literally through sort of taking on difficult new assignments. But also part of it is about how we lead others. And if you think about the way in which we lead, what we, what we do is we, we, we try behaving a little bit differently with our colleagues um, and we get feedback from them. My colleague, Herminia Ibarra, at London Business School. She's got a great book. It's called Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader. And her thesis is that I have no idea if I'm going to be a good leader. So I start behaving a bit differently, a little bit you know, more, more thoughtfully about building on and amplifying the work of others, summarizing at the end of the meeting, trying to show my almost my leadership credentials. And I see how people are reacting to me and I build on that. And it's, a, it's almost a sort of socially constructed process leadership. And the point is that th that is really hard to do when you aren't meeting people because all those social cues you get from observing others and getting feedback from others, all of those social cues are attenuated over Zoom. So that's that. the, the point is that development is a multifaceted thing and our capacity to develop when we're sitting in our own offices is dramatically lower than it was when we were operating in more sort of social circumstances. Great, thanks very much. And um, Alistair, can I just kind of pick up the, the point that was being made by uh, uh, Francesca around how do you, what does good practice look like mm. in the lobbying? Well, world? yes, I mean, uh, one of the frustrating things about the lo lobbying scandals is that they never involve professional lobbyists. I mean, there are people who, who do this for a living, who have codes of conduct, uh, who, who are accountable to us, uh, you know, however limited that accountability may be and uh, who go about their business uh, in, a, in a proper way. Uh, and, and the issue which we're confronting at the moment is of politicians, ex-politicians, civil servants, going in and out of a revolving door and uh, you know, huge sums of money being spent with people's you know, mates, relatives and, and, uh, and other associates. Um, I mean, the, most of the other so-called lobbying scandals uh, that we've had in the past decade have involved an undercover journalist, often from the Telegraph, posing as a lobbyist um, and catching out a politician. So what that's demonstrated is that there is a problem of political corruption, not that there is a problem of unethical uh, lobbying. But I, I would certainly, you know, I, I, I completely agree with Francesca's um, description that, you know, I mean, we lobby um, uh, in the way that you described, you know, we lobbied hard last year to get proper uh, financial support for people who are self-employed. Uh, we, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the measures um, that were introduced to um, support business, the extension of furlough, that we lobbied on all those things in conjunction with other bodies. That was public, it was open. We're very happy to discuss it. It doesn't bear any re relationship, any resemblance at all with kind of phone calls late at night to people that you used to work with, um, which are, you know, which should be recorded, you know. And the, the main thing we say is that politicians and other, you know, senior civil servants should publish their diaries in full in a timely manner and disclose who they've met and what they've discussed. Fascinating. Um, Jeremy, just kind of picking up Julian's point around the office being a social place and I loved your comment about, um, I'm not sure, you talk about thirsty Thursdays, I'm not sure what the adjectives for Fridays, I'm sure we'll come up with one. Um, but but how, how has that sort of played out over the past year? How, how's the sort of social side? I mean, I know you did some uh, fantastic exercises in terms of walking from across the whole of the UK metaphorically yeah, yeah. just talk a bit through that that'd be really helpful yeah it's been thanks Richard it's it, it's been a challenge but really important and something that we've we, we've really kept at the forefront of our mind in terms of trying to connect with with people and and yes you're right we had our we had our Hayes McIntyre Hayes McIntyre connect week we did our virtual walk in one day um from from uh, Land's End to John O'Groats and beyond in the end, uh, we, we, which was great in terms of engaging people, getting people outside. They could do it during any, any part of the day. So so any sort of events we've been running um, have been really good. Interestingly, um, two weeks ago, we did a cocktail evening where we, anyone that wanted to participate, we sent a cocktail pack out uh, to them. And we had uh, three teams of two partners who were then the the, the cocktail makers on all, all on uh, all on Remo actually, Richard. Um, so so last year, 
before um, lockdown, we did a partners behind the bar session, a, 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 a proper one, but but this was obviously all virtual. Um, so the the partners were all dressed up and 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 demonstrated the making of these cocktail, and it, it actually you sort of think well, just a usual drinks evening or cocktail evening the number of comments we've had back that said it was the best social event that they'd ever been to at Hayes McIntyre, live or virtual. It was really entertaining. And I think the chat box where there's obviously a huge amount of banter going on uh, that all 200 people can see and all 200 people could participate in just made it really live. And it, it was it, it was brilliant. Um, really, really good. So it, it, yeah, all I'd say to people is just keep persevering with those social events. Sometimes we think that we're all we're all worn out with Zoom and quizzes and all that sort of thing. But actually, if you get the right thing, it can really work and pull people together. We had so we're a total of between 350, 400 people. We had over 200 people participating live on on, on screen, which was brilliant. Amazing, Francesca. Do you have any sort of um, anecdotes in that space? Oh, well? yeah. You know what? I well, I love people's creativity, and and often you tend to find that you uh, you 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 ask or someone suggests doing something, and 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 there's people have got such brilliant ideas. I mean, just simple things that are just entertaining. Someone did something this week where they asked all of us to share privately our favorite emoji. Watch the emoji you use most. There is it a smiley face, is it a grumpy face? And then we had to guess which who was linked to which emoji. It was hilarious, absolutely hilarious. It was just very simple, very funny, beautifully done. And we've now got a, a little mocked up team structure of our emojis rather than people. Um, and it's very very, very entertaining and I think it's a it's a great way of also getting some of the people in your team who perhaps aren't running things aren't as visible uh, just to share how creative they can be because it is the, it is the small social interactions a bit like the chat you'd have around the coffee machine uh, that make all the difference and, and and I think it's fantastic when you've got people really stepping up to bring a bit more a bit of fun into our lives my goodness me how much have we missed a, missed some of that something that make, brings a smile to people's faces and helps you connect with people in a different way. So I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan of making a little bit of time to do those things because they are what makes the difference. Excellent. Julian, in your in your dean capacity, or your deputy dean capacity, if I've got the job title correct, I mean, you also have a group of uh, lecturers, if that's the right yeah. word, yeah. you need to be working with. You also have uh, a lot of students who perhaps want to uh, mix together and are less worried about whether the presentation is on screen or face to face. But how, how have you managed that managerial side of your role? Yeah. And we at London Business School, like many universities, we've moved now back into what we call hybrid teaching, which I mean, it's a conversation for another day. But half the students are in the classroom and half are, are coming in on Zoom. And in some ways, it's the worst of both worlds. So it's, uh, but that's a that's a, se a separate issue. Let me let me ask answer your, your first question. So in terms of how do we get the most out of a group of people who are mostly working away. I mean, what the, the one tip I would offer, which I'm trying to work on, which I think is generalizable, is to be very thoughtful about that one or two days a week when people are in the office. And if you go back to the, the, the little survey we did 30 or 40 minutes ago, you know, creativity was this thing which everybody said we're really struggling with. And, and that's, that's a fact. I have yet to see an online creativity tool which actually really works, particularly when we're trying to create collaboratively. So, so we've got to separate out the things which you literally cannot do online um, and make use of the, you know, that day in the office when we can all gather together to do that versus the things which are just harder to do online. And I would say that a lot of one to one meetings with colleagues, with direct reports actually work pretty well online. I mean, Zoom conversations are actually quite good in small numbers of when small numbers of people are involved. It just takes more time. So for me, we've got to be, be very thoughtful about how we divide up the activities that we're doing when we come back to the office versus the ones that we can continue to do when we're working remotely. Thanks very much. And, and Alistair, we were talking a bit earlier around how uh, in management terms, it can be quite important to make sure people don't go off on a tangent and yes. uh, get very engaged, but then don't actually yes. find, oh, whoops, I'd rather you hadn't gone there. How, how have you managed yeah. that, Alan? Um, not, not enormously well in some cases. Uh, so we, we, last year, we were big on enthusiasm and commitment. 
huge levels of energy. Uh, and we did have a number of cases of people just, you know, really charging off and doing something. Uh, and there's a loud screeching noise when it all went horribly wrong. And, and, and that, that mostly came down to, you know, partly it was my fault for um, not being sufficiently clear at the beginning um, that this wasn't urgent. I didn't want this to be done like the next day. I, I was kind of trying to set something in motion that I was sort of expecting we would discuss three or four times before it finally hit the tarmac. Uh, and, and by just not, you know, not describing it in those terms, I accidentally detonated something that kind of blew up and made a mess. Um, and partly also, I, I, you know, I completely just take what uh, Julian said about one-to-one -one works absolutely fine. It just seems much harder though, when you're working collaboratively over something that's extended over a long period of time. It's just much easier for people to miscommunicate, not get the point, uh, and then set off on something which they think is what everybody else is expecting them to do that just isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we've had to do a lot more kind of cross-checking, uh, a lo lot more kind of, I'm, I'm very informal normally, but I've had to become a bit more structured and a bit more uh, rigid in what I do to, to make sure that things aren't just, you know, rolling off in lots of different unhelpful directions. Mm. I'm afraid it's now um, time for us to uh, draw the conclusions uh, to a close. So I'd like to thank um, all our presenters today. Um, obviously, thank uh, Alistair, thank Julian, um, Jeremy and Francesca, and uh, wish you all, uh, when you get there, a great weekend, a relaxing weekend, and uh, bye for now.